Thank you for tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdill, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's January 2024, and you're listening to episode 377, which is a conversation about the film The Book of Clarence, which is in theaters now. On this episode, I'm joined by Cole Brigette, who is a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary and the Moody Bible Institute. He teaches classes in Bible exposition and systematic theology, and also writes extensively about theology and popular culture. I'm also joined by C.L. Mitchell, who is a graduate of Andersonville Theological Seminary, Phoenix Seminary, and is currently a Ph.D. student at South African Theological Seminary. C.L. Mitchell also teaches classes in systematic theology and Bible exposition. C.L. Mitchell has written an online cultural apologetics film review article about the Book of Clarence, and his article is called The Danger of Rewriting Jesus, a review of the Book of Clarence, and you can read it for free on our website, equip.org. Cool, and C.L., it's good to have you on the podcast. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to join both of you. Thank you. Well, as I noted, today's conversation is about the film The Book of Clarence, which is in theaters now. And I would say when I saw the film, I don't know if it's appealing to a certain audience, but when I saw the film, it was primarily Black folks in the audience watching this film. And so what is this film about? Sure. I guess I'll start off just giving an overview and We'll go from there. Uh, Book of Clarence, written and directed by James Samuel, who is a British singer-songwriter and producer, probably uh, better known as The Bullets. It's his uh, his stage name. He's uh, he's the brother of Grammy Award-winning soul singer Seal. People probably know who that is. The uh, the movie is is set in Jerusalem, AD thirty three follows a young black Jewish man named Clarence, who is played by Lakeith Stanfield. And Clarence is a, let's say he's a, a down-on-his-luck man who's a, he's a bit of a, a shyster. He's sort of chasing these, you know, get-rich-quick schemes and accruing debts. But he learns about the film's version of Jesus and initially sets out to become his his 13th disciple, but ultimately ends up trying to to replicate Jesus's ministry in an effort to to make money quick, and it's it's actually a bit of an interesting concept, uh, at least set up for a comedy. And I think if the film had been a bit more sincere in its storytelling and had you know less of an agenda, it might actually have said something profound. It's a very it's a very clever in concept and also much in, in execution. Some of our listeners might know you mentioned some of the people that were connected to the director, and it's also produced by Jay-Z as well. So people might have heard of Jay-Z because he's a well-known hip-hop artist and also does all kinds of other things as well, clothing, etc. So it is a very interesting premise, and it's obviously got connections to Jesus as people have thought about him in the Bible anyway. I don't know exactly how accurate, but the Jesus vibe, and it takes place in in Jerusalem. But, you know, when you see these kind of films, why should Christians even want to see this kind of film? I I wasn't sure when I saw it. I I couldn't decide if it was trying to be you mentioned comedy. You know, these kind of irreverent biblical comedies have been done before by Monty Python, for example, but I didn't think it would, was as irreverent as those are, as funny as Monty Python. I don't know that it was really attempting to be as humorous or a spoof as much as it was seeking to forward an agenda. It, it seems, in my opinion, to seek to suggest that Jesus, as you were 
presented with him from the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus, as he was articulated from historic Christendom and is propagated from the pulpit, is not in fact the Jesus that you recognize him to be. Now, this may be something of an inaccurate story that we're telling. However, it is in all probability closer to the truth because Jesus, if he is to be understood, is to be understood as a liberator. He's to be understood as a social activist. He's to be understood as an individual who addresses oppressive social issues with individuals who are deemed disadvantaged in culture. So I think while it had humorous moments, um, I don't think that their main goal was humor as much as it was somewhat of a an irrelevant sacrilegious presentation that sought to rewrite the Jesus of biblical and historic Christianity. Yeah, I would I would agree with with what Mitchell's saying here. It it seems to be a sort of intentional rewriting is a good word. You know, with with westerns, we talk about westerns. We we talk about uh, revisionist westerns that sort of go back and, and try to try to rewrite certain things and and change things around that we know about history. And it, it very much does this. It's a revisionism a retconning, if you will, of the story that we think we know by virtue of, of having been raised in, in Western Christianity. That's sort of its, its angle into the world. Well, because it has this irreverence to it, especially the opening scene is establishing that for sure. Why would Christians even care about this film? I mean, I think most Christians would say, why would I see something blasphemous or even care to know about it? Well, I just speaking from my own perspective here, it's one of those films that I, I wouldn't recommend a Christian seeing. I don't necessarily think it's as important as it maybe it thinks itself to be, or maybe tries to set itself up to be. So I do think that you know a Christian not watching the film is certainly a a fair enough response to seeing it. That's just sort of my take on it. I would probably respond in this way. Firstly. I would discourage seeing this film. I'm not sure personally, and this has no bearing upon you as our interviewer or anyone that we are connected with. I'm not sure that I could in clear conscience promote something that seeks to undermine the biblical Christ and the true historicity of Christ as presented in Christendom throughout the ages. That's number one. Number two, I'm not certain that I would want to promote this film in so much as it seeks to undermine the legitimacy of the four Gospels and replace it with Gnostic Gospels. So it really is a Pandoric box that opens up this ideology that says what you've been reading may not be true at all. Third, I think it promotes a hermeneutic that the text can be played with, a, a hermeneutic of suspicion, the idea that scripture is not the infallible, inerrant word of God, that it is not the verbal plenary word of God. And so it's sort of up for grabs and we can make of it what we'd like to make of it. Next, I don't know that it's what we want to promote for believers in so much as it incites bias. It incites division. It suggests that the real oppressed people are black individuals and that salvation is rewritten because true salvation is not what you've seen within the framework of the Bible. No, true salvation is liberation from oppression. And there are several other things that I could say about that. So if one were to see it, they should be aware that this film is really a harbinger, a warning concerning the necessity for believers to know what they believe and develop a reality outside of our bubble of the varied attacks against Christianity, against biblical truth, 
And so they know how to point their apologetic efforts, namely against division, against falsity, against bias, ethnic bias, etc. So how does the film portray Jesus? I mean, if you're a Christian, you're seeing it, you know that it's not quite what we see in the gospel accounts in the Bible. It's a little bit different. Yeah. So the film is going to rely on a portrayal of Jesus that is is lifted largely from the Gnostic gospels. I mean, we could spend days on this particular topic. I was just going over Gnosticism in one of my classes, and it, it can easily become a big topic to get your arms around. But what I'll do, at least, is try to give you an overview of, of what the Gnostic Gospels you know, sort of were. The Gnostic Gospels were part of the 52 texts that were discovered in uh, Nag Hammadi, Egypt, in a series of caves at the mountain known as Jabal al-Tarif. And, and these texts included these, you know, sort of call them secret Gospels and poems and myths that attributed a number of sayings to Jesus of Nazareth. And these secret writings, so to speak, are attached to the names of individuals in Jesus's inner circle, such as, you know, Thomas and, and, and Mary. The Gnostic Gospels, of course, are, are largely a result of the Gnostic Christians who appeared in the later first century, second century, and third centuries in the early church and they really promoted this view that came to be known as the heresy of docetism, this idea that Jesus was not actually incarnate, that he was not you know, human or fully human or something to that degree. And this stemmed from a lot of ideas rooted in philosophical Platonism, which saw all matter as evil and, and matters of the spirit as being singularly good. So the portrayal of Jesus in the film is sort of lifted from these, these Gnostic gospel accounts sure Mitchell can talk about that. I would certainly like to mention something about that. I'd like to go back directly to your question. Um, how does this film present Jesus? And I think the appropriate answer is, which one? See, the individual viewing the film is presented with one Jesus that has 12 apostles. Then Clarence wants to present himself as the new Messiah, albeit not Jesus, a messianic figure. Then there is Benjamin, who is an individual who is a beggar, who is certainly down on his luck and is begging throughout most of the film until he is healed of his disposition, not a physical malady, but certainly a socioeconomic malady, which is why suddenly coinage or money is running out of his hand. He goes to individuals who clean him up. And when they clean him up, he certainly has the appearance of a messianic figure. In fact, what they're trying to propagate is more of a recognizable, acceptable messianic figure than in fact the black Jesus is or than the Clarence figure is. And he's certainly empowering individuals by giving money away that the black Jesus empowered him with. And then he ends up on a cross. Uh, Clarence ends up on a cross. Other messianic figures end up on a cross. Ironically, in the film, Jesus is sort of betrayed and heading to a cross, we would think. But we never actually see that Jesus on a cross. So you have a series of figures that are messianic, but only one person who's named Jesus. And that individual, as you suggested, is a Gnostic Jesus more so. When Mary, the supposed mother of Jesus in the film, is giving a bit of historicity concerning her son, she recounts a history in his youth that directly comes from the Gnostic literature. So this Jesus in the film is one of knowledge, gnosis, secret knowledge. And he was referring to docetism. That's from the word dakeo. He only appeared to be human or physiological. So this Jesus is sort of there sometimes, and he's not there. He has a hood on. He's elusive. So as much as he's present, he's also absent. And he has this mystic air about him. He stops stones in midair. But is this due to an art? Is this due to enlightenment? Is this due to the power of God? 
That's one Jesus. The other messianic figure, the new Messiah, Clarence, is a charlatan. He's full of chicanery. He doesn't even believe in God or in Jesus, but he's a liberator. He's enlightened. This secret gnosis that comes through the imbibement of, of substance abuse comes upon him. And at first we see him and he appears to be this charlatan that's using drugs and has an idea. But later on in the development of the film, it really wasn't an idea as much as it was enlightenment. We certainly know or are led to believe that his whole ploy is going to fall in on him when he is forced to walk on water by pilot, and to all of our surprise, including his, suddenly he is thoroughly enlightened and is enabled to walk on water. He's a miracle working liberator, although not wearing the title or the name rather, officially Jesus. And the other figure, Benjamin is on the cross. He had the sash. He had the glow. He has the mystic vibe, as it were. He gave some wealth to individuals. They celebrated him. In fact, he's going to become the Euro-Caucasian figure who the black individual, the black artist, is painting while the others are not painting him. And he's going to be the individual who's actually cursing them. So what we're presented with in the film are you take your pick of Jesus. You take your pick of the messianic figures. And by the way, these individuals may not necessarily be legitimate, but the legitimacy is up to the attendee. You choose who you've chosen, but here's what we're suggesting. The real liberating Christ is the one that we're uncomfortable with. And the real liberating Christ is the one that really has sought to free us and bless us while the one that we are accustomed to is the one that curses us. Now, all of that history aside, I think what they're trying to do is play off of what Josephus said, that there were multiple individuals in the first century who were making claims to being a messianic figure, but they've placed before us the three that they really want us to acknowledge. There's the mystic one, there's the new messianic one, and then there's the classic one who may not really be the hero that we all assumed he was. Yeah, I do agree with, with what Mitchell's saying. The, the movie, it, it's sort of a, a difficult question to answer about Jesus specifically because the movie is sort of intentionally complicates the question. Um, that's, that's part of what's what's driving it. Uh, and so I guess if you're if the question is about Jesus himself, Jesus proper, uh, the way that they're portraying that figure, um, it pulls very much from these Gnostic traditions. But the film itself sort of exists to complicate the question of the Messiah, to complicate the question of Jesus's identity uh, by bringing in these different facets and, and visions, if you will, as, as Mitchell was saying. I want to tell you once again about the brand new podcast that we have released called Christian Research Journal Reads. And what it is, is taking our online articles that are the most popular, the ones that are accessed the most on our website, equip.org, and putting them into an audio format. So some articles you might have missed because we have more than 45 years worth of articles. That is thousands and thousands of them on our website. And so it will be a very rich podcast bringing you a variety of articles from all different kinds of topics, probably some that you might not have read before because there are older articles from our journal, but there are most popular that people access the most on our website. So don't miss out on that. Go to your favorite platform where you subscribe to your podcasts and please add Christian Research Journal Reads to that. In addition, I just want to remind you that everything is now free. It is all free at our website, equip.org. That's E-Q-U-I-P dot O-R-G. And it no longer requires a subscription for you to access all of our articles. We've got new ones every week. I'm talking to different authors about their new articles that we're publishing. And so you don't want to miss out on that. It's just a wealth of information. And if you're enjoying this podcast, if you're enjoying Christian Research Journal Reads and accessing all of our articles as a wonderful resource to equip you, then 
we would ask that you would think about giving us a tip because we are still obviously paying our authors for their great research and work that they do for us. And a tip could be something as little as $5. Just maybe skip one of your lattes at your favorite place or skip a meal out or a lunch out or something like that. And we would be so grateful for a tip, $5, $10, whatever you can do. And you can do that very easily if you go to equip.org and you go to journal and click on postmodern realities. Any one of the landing pages has a link to give us a tip. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you for your subscription to Christian Research Journal Reads. And now back to the rest of our conversation about the film, The Book of Clarence, with our guests today, Cole Burgett and C.L. Mitchell. Well, the opening scene shows a crucifixion of multiple people, which is not inaccurate in that that happened during that time period. And even before that time period, there would be crucifixions of various folks. But I think just speaking to what you all were talking about, they're giving us different versions of Jesus, all played by both white and black actors. And then they do kind of also present a Jesus that maybe was the real Jesus. It's kind of like Clarence was a wanted to make money and try to pose as Jesus. And he starts out not believing God, being atheistic, and then maybe having some kind of change of heart throughout the movie. So with all these different characters, there's just this question of who is the real Jesus. And so what are some of the modern ideologies that you see in the film? Because even though we would say Christians, we don't recommend this, there are people watching this film and it sounds interesting to them and they might not know that much about Christianity and think, well, maybe this is what Christianity is about. I'll tackle that just for a moment. Let me revisit a few things that you said, Melanie. First, Clarence certainly seems to evince a change of heart. The difficulty is he never makes a profession or a confession of faith. He never directly argues that he believes in the real Jesus, as at least they present him in the film, nor that he has really come to the conviction of a steadfast belief in God as much as he seems to be an enlightened person And by the way, the means by which he has this Jesus air about him, in Gnosticism at least, would also involve almost an adoptionistic kind of ideology, that it seems that the Christ came upon him at some point and enabled him to do and be that which he historically and previously could not be or do. So he does seem to have a change of heart, but not a biblically informed, Christ-centered change of heart. Next, when we're looking at multiple people crucified, yes, that's true. Josephus writes that there was at one time 3,000 people in 70 AD under General Titus who were crucified on the Temple Mount. And we know throughout the history of the first century that the Romans had absolutely no problem doing this. However, this particular portrayal, again, is not accurate in its portrayal. Of course, can any film really depict what the actual crucifixion was like? But this particular crucifixion event fails to fill itself with biblically informed details. And I'll remind the listener of this, that crucifixion was such a complex, hated, despised activity that not only was there the necessity to have a word invented for it to describe its pain, excruciating that which comes out of the cross, but we have more information about what a crucifixion actually involved from the four Gospels than all of the ancient Near Eastern literature on crucifixions because people would only refer to it mostly. They would not necessarily describe its horror, as it were. So again, if an individual, if a reader wants to get or a listener wants to acquire a more adequate or accurate portrayal, 
that's going to be found in the Gospels more than it is going to be found in this film. The film falls far short of that. When it comes to what Jesus says, to address your question here, how is the Christian to look at this and say, okay, what are we dealing with? When you see these messianic figures, there's an ambiguity. It seems in definite article, Jesus is a way, not a definite article, the way. And the way that he is, is the way to enlightenment rather than the way to the Father, the way to salvific grace alone, through faith alone, in the person and work of Christ, his Christ alone. Yeah, the modern ideas you can see, like you like you were asking about, you can see in everything that Mitchell's saying. There are a lot of anachronisms in this film, anachronism, a sort of revisioning of history as we talked about before. Just to give one example, right, that the film is set in AD 33, but when Clarence as a character starts out, and this is part of his arc in the film, he doesn't doubt, right? He he has this very strong conviction that God doesn't exist. It's this really sort of this anachronistic version of atheism that he holds to. When he starts off initially just trying to sort of replicate the success of of what the film would consider to be the historical Jesus of Nazareth, the one that, you know, Clarence encounters and tries to replicate his success through the teachings and things. When Clarence is teaching, his teachings center on things you know, like like knowing, believing, knowing versus believing and things like this. Everything is about moving away from self-centeredness and into compassion in his arc. But the vision that he starts out with and the arc that he goes through, it's a very anachronistic kind of character arc even in his movement through the film. So there are a lot of different ideologies and different versions and views and brought back into the, the setting of the film. Um, so that it, you know, the word to use, which we've talked about this word on this podcast before, but the, the idea of post-modernity, it's a very sort of, in a way, postmodern retelling of the story. Uh, with a heavy dose of, of some other ideologies as well. If I may enter a point of clarification. So is this true to the biblical text? And, and I want to give a very direct answer to that. The answer is no, with an exclamation point. He forwards this idea as Cole said, knowledge is greater than belief. Now, I want to make several statements, terse statements about that. Number one, Christendom is not about easy believism. That's a misrepresentation. Christians believe in thinking to honor God with their mind, but they think in their beliefs. So they're not individuals who are suggesting take a leap of uninformed faith. That is not what we are to do. We are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, comma, dot, dot, dot. Now, why is that so important? Because it is a sin not to love God intellectually. Because God doesn't just simply place before us a series of things to believe. He gives a series of evidences. Scripture is replete with evidence throughout the warp and woof of the scripture. In fact, when Paul recounts the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, according to the scriptures, in other words, his apologetic argument is this. If in fact what I am presenting to you is not in consistency, is not in accordance with the scriptures, then it may be dismissed. So this is not the sort of Christianity that the Bible propagates. This is not what the Christian wants to throw him or herself into. No, this is a side of early Christian heresy that sought to say, no, the teachings of the apostles are not sufficient for us. No, the first testament is not sufficient for us. The Tanakh falls short. That's just the, the physical message. But one should, as origin, go deeper into the spiritual, mystic things that can only be known by the Spirit. And what is the check and balance? Well, if it doesn't mesh or match with the Word of God, then one must spiritualize it and realize that therein 
Within one's enlightenment is found the truth and it need not be defended. But that is absolutely not what Christ teaches, what his apostles taught, nor is that what is presented throughout the whole of scripture. When I was watching this movie, I thought of, because we have published some articles in our journal about the Black Hebrew Israelites, and also the primary, there are a few white characters, but primarily all the entire cast is Black. Um, Do you think that this has kind of a twinges of either Black Hebrew Israelite type of theology or a Black Jesus or kind of what we would call um, liberation theology at all? I certainly do. And I'll say this. I think your conglomeration of what you suggested is very important. It's not one alone. It's a mixture. It's a concophony of things thrown in together. So it has the James Cone sort of liberation theology. We, of course, see that in this idea that the sinners are the oppressors and the oppressors are the Caucasians. We see a few Caucasians who are oppressed, some of the gladiators, Benjamin the beggar, but this is a rare occasion of individuals who have gotten lost in the system. And the only reason why they are included in the gladiatorial gathering or in the streets as beggars is because they happen to share oppression as the camaraderie. However, that's not the majority. You also see that a black individual can take on the post of an oppressor as demonstrated by the owner of the gladiators who is placed in partial white face. The idea is he's a black man playing in a Caucasian oppressive system that he's enacting on his own, an attempt to redefine and repicture the tax collector in first century Palestine or Israel or Jerusalem, as it were. You also see that. But what you also see is Hebrew Israelitism to a degree. It is the blacks who are the true Israelites. But Hebrew Israelitism today, Black Hebrew Israelitism, would actually go further than that and say, no, 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 no. It's individuals of color. It's individuals of color. So you can actually have individuals, for instance, you can have the tribe of Judah who can be the American Blacks or the tribe of Benjamin, which can, which can be the West Indian Blacks or the tribe of Levi, which can be the Haitians or Ephraim that can be the Puerto Ricans or Manasseh, the Cubans or Simeon, the Dominicans or Zebulun, the Guatemalans or Gad, the Native Americans. Some would question that or Reuben, the, the Seminole Indians, or Asher, the Columbia to Uruguay or the Issachar tribe, the Mexicans or Naphtali, the Argentinians. So the idea actually, while it has some aspects of Hebrew Israelitism, would still fall short of the extremeness of that particular position that we see floating around and propagated in modernity. Really, then, there is an underlying message. The underlying message is whether we look at this as James Conism, whether we look at this as liberation theology, whether we look at this as Black Hebrew Israelite theology, here's the idea. It's the people of color who have fallen into an oppressive system built by the Caucasians. They are to fall. We are the victims. Salvation must be defined not as this mystical sort of facet that you've seen presented in the gospel and Christendom housed in the Bible. No, true salvation for those of color, for those oppressed, is liberation. And in fact, any other message is a message that presents an insufficient Christ from an insufficient Bible and is propagated by insufficient religious leaders. So it is a mixture to tell one message of oppression. And to Mitchell's point here, I know we were, we were all sort of texting about this after we came out of the, the film, and we, we all sort of hit on this idea. There's Conism with some black liberation theology with some Gnosticism thrown in there. It's an interesting admixture of all these different sort of ideas that come into play. 
But one of the things that I want to point out, and Mitchell, I'm sure would have some interesting views on on this and, and would love to talk about it. None of the actual historicity of the situation that is going on in Israel or Palestine at the time is factored into the film's narrative. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of this. The Pharisees, for example, play virtually no role in the narrative proper. The narrative is reframed, if you will. Even the parts of the story that are about this quote-unquote traditional Jesus narrative, to the degree that the film actually has one, they're all sort of reframed to be a story about Romans, very Caucasian Romans, as the bad guys, and the degree to that there are Jewish authorities in there, there are these black religious leaders. But the Pharisees themselves virtually play no role in this. And then Pilate himself, Pilate is played by James McAvoy in the film, but but the character of Pilate himself, he is depicted as this, uh, it, he's, he's very sort of a, a slimy sort of politician uh, who is sort of like under the thumb of Rome, required by Rome to kill all of these potential messiahs. It's, it's this oppressive regime idea. Nothing like the sort of, um, the pilot that we see who is in scripture, who is just ready to wash his hands of the situation, who's there to just to, to keep a lid on all of these political turmoils that are rippling throughout the, the first first century world. None of that is sort of brought in, and, and the history itself is sort of overwritten to tell a different kind of, of narrative. Mitchell, if you've got anything you want to say with that. Oh, absolutely. I, I think you've just made a very important point, and that is this doesn't simply seek to rewrite Jesus. It redacts history. History itself, yeah. Yeah, we and, talk and, it's, and it seeks to redact history in such a way that not only can we adopt a hermeneutic of sus- suspicion, not only can we adopt a hermeneutic that plays with the text that is terribly subjective, but we can also adopt a philosophical underpinning. History is fiction agreed upon. And if we get together and we agree that this is the way it was, we can use history, rewrite history, reform, reshape history to say whatever we'd like to say with history. And here's what we want to say with history. We want to say whatever you think history was, it was really an agreement to establish a system by Caucasians to oppress those who are underprivileged within society. Namely, the tip of that iceberg is represented by the blacks who, by the way, have had to do what they've had to do to survive. Whether that's gladiatorial, whether that's hustling, taking advantage of others, chariot racing, all of this stuff, smoking drugs, they've had to do that in order to survive in a system that was built so that they could not win. And even if they give you their word, i.e. pilot, i.e. the owner of the gladiators, they're going to not keep their word and they're going to kill you anyway because the system is not built for you to win. This is a rewriting of history itself. I also want to let our listeners know if you want to dig a little deeper and we will have links in the show notes. We have published an article back in 2016 called The Origin and Insufficiency of the Black Hebrew Israelite Movement. So when we were talking about that, you might want to read that for further study. And that article is for free at our website, equip.org. So What about just some of the things we've talked about, how it presents liberation, social liberation? What are some of the societal consequences of various ideas that are presented in this film? I mean, what does it say about culture? What does it want to communicate to the audience about culture? Cole, I'll let you start on that one. This is very much a film of the moment. At least that's how I felt watching it. It feels like a a film that is perfectly primed for a, a lot of the conversations surrounding racial equality that, that the culture is, is going to now. And what I what I think is is interesting about 
the sort of the message the film promotes to, to the degree that the film actually sort of gets around to finding a point. And, and I think of the ending scene where, where Clarence has his encounter with what we would consider the, the film's version of the historical Jesus when he, he is, is in fact resurrected. The, the, the film wants you to understand that the, this journey that Clarence has, has gone on in, you know, freeing the oppressed black gladiators. So there are some who are of different ethnicities in there as well, but they're, they're primarily black. In the journey that he goes on, the realizations he comes to have about, you know, quote unquote, the system, all of this leads to him being, and I think the film wants you to, to walk away with this, it all sort of leads to him being in some way, shape, or form touched by the God figure or Jesus figure that quote unquote really is there. I do not think the film is, it's not made from an atheistic, insincere perspective. I, I wouldn't say that. I would say the film does have a sincerity to it that it, it expects people to have in this culture, which is probably just where we are as, as a post-secular society. We have sort of left secularism behind in the, the 20th century, and we have this new sort of fascination with spirituality and, and things like that. And, and I think this film is part and, part and parcel with that, and it encourages that, even if it is these different versions of Jesus that you're, you're looking for and finding uh, that, that factor into the what it is the film wants you to walk away with. But I do think the film is suggesting that Clarence finds, to some degree, he's touched by this whatever version of God or Jesus that is truly out there. Because the true Jesus, the true God, however you want to frame that, uh, based on how the film you know portrays it without really landing anywhere definitively, regardless of what you're you're going to say about him, that being, the true God or the true Jesus is certainly going to agree with, is certainly going to endorse, is certainly going to affirm whatever it is that Clarence himself has found. You see this at the very end of the film with, again, Clarence being resurrected. So suffice to say, you know, what is it saying about culture? It's almost like the film says, uh, well, whatever, whatever angle you come at this from, your version of Christianity, if it is not in line with this kind of liberation idea, this liberation theology idea, if it does not land there, then whatever your view is, is insufficient. If you maintain a view of the traditional uh, biblical Christian view of Christ— if it does not at least incorporate this liberation theology, then it is by definition inadequate. It is not enough. This is why Clarence is resurrected at the end of the film, because he's he's uncovered this this he's had this enlightenment. He's come to this realization. There's that it's sort of represented in the film as a light bulb over his head. I know it's sort of farcical, but that's sort of the point. And that light bulb appears again at the very end. It's it's this idea of enlightenment. So I think uh, where where this is saying, you know, culturally from a theological perspective is, you know, there are different cultures, different theological views are going to come at this character of Jesus from different angles. But the film is ultimately saying whatever angle you're coming at it from, if it doesn't at least uh, have this view in it, it is ultimately inadequate. And I think the film sort of, you know, it pokes at the viewer to try to pick that particular fight. I would wholeheartedly agree. I, so with that, I would make a few terse statements. First, it's arguing for social liberation. It's suggesting I'm the victim. You're the oppressor. I'm innocent. You're guilty. I'm actually better, and you know it. You're doing this because you know I'm stronger. I'm a king. Religion that does not liberate you from your immediate circumstances is worthless. And you're waiting for God to rescue you then in the by and by. But you need liberation now. Liberation is the gospel. Liberation is salvation. Enlightenment and knowledge provides this, not 
faith. It's adultery to engage with our oppressors who will not be raised by God, but the person that will be raised by God in the end, indeed justified, is the person who's enlightened as a liberator and who is enlightened because they've been liberated. So what problems does it create in society? What problems does it put its finger on? The social, ethnic, distrust, disunity, division. It's actually encouraging us. Do not find camaraderie with the oppressors as the woman caught in the act of being with a Roman was, as presented in the film, No, instead, you are to stick with your own people. You are to stick with your own pigment. You are to stick with your own social framework and fight the system. Fight and defeat the system. And then I think what we're watching is, and this is what really concerns me, Melanie. This is what really concerns me, Cole. We're watching the ethnic social editing of the gospel itself, which is of the ultimate nature of that which is dangerous because it threatens to so enlighten a person that it causes them to be profusely ignorant of the very gospel that saves them from the ultimate oppression of sin and death. And I would just say irony of ironies. Gnosticism. <laughs> that's, that's, that is sort of what that idea is. This sort of, you know, secret knowledge, the uncovering of, you know, finding the little nugget of, of truth within, you know, the nuggets of truth that gives you a little bit more enlightenment than the rest of everybody else and having to double down on that. So it's very clear that the ideas the film plays with are also the ideas that are driving the message. There is a a sort of, I know we've mentioned the Gnostic Gospels, but there is a, a kind of fascination with those particular accounts of Jesus that the film has. And I think it goes beyond just, you know, this is a different way of portraying it. It's actually a way for the film to argue that there is value and even truth, a capital T truth, to be found in those particular texts. And, and it incorporates those ideas. So I do think there are, some dangerous views that the unthinking Christian, put it that way, that the Christian who just doesn't know their Bible, I don't know how else to say it, the Christian who just doesn't know the text of Scripture can easily be hoodwinked by. And I I think, you know, this sort of goes without saying, but it probably should be stated, that these ideas pushed by the film, especially regarding, you know, the fighting of the system, whatever, you know, you frame the system to be, is so at odds with what you see Paul instructing Christians to do in the epistles. This is so at odds with what you see the apostles and the way that they handled themselves in the face of oppression. This is so at odds with Paul, who writes the letters to Timothy, you know, telling Timothy, so many people have left me. Don't you leave me too. You stand there and you endure. You finish the race. There's none of this language in the text of Scripture suggesting that Paul is telling Timothy to fight the oppressors, to beat them at their own game, to try to beat the system. In fact, you know, the view that seems to be put forth in the Scriptures, in my estimation, is that the system is there, Christ has overcome it, but for the time being, it is to be endured. And the measure of the Christian is not the one who liberates. It is the one who endures, endures. That's one of the recurring themes we come to time and time again in my particular New Testament class is the sheer number of times Christians are exhorted to endure which is so at odds with where the culture is today. And I think it's reflected in this film. This is just another film in a history of Jesus films. And I want to point our listeners to an article that we published back in 2016 called Jesus Films. Who does Hollywood say that I am? Because I'm sure people are wondering where, what kind of 
other films about Jesus are out there, and we have covered some of those on the Christian Research Journal. Well, on a much lighter note, you are two Bible teachers at a high school, and it's still kind of the beginning of the year. It's the end of January. Do you have any advice for our listeners about how they should be faithful in daily Bible reading? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. When you, let's see, one of the things I, I try to teach my students, you know, when, when you read a text, read the full context. We're very bad in Christian culture or just culture in, in general today with sound biting things. We tear things out of context all the time. We like our favorite verses. We like to have memory verses. It's not that memory verses are terribly wrong, but what I tell my students is if you're going to memorize a verse, make sure that you at least memorize the context that it occurs in, if not the verse before it and the verse after it, to keep you from taking those things out of context. So yes, uh, my advice in, in being diligent in Bible reading is when you're reading a section of Scripture, be sure to read more than just that section of Scripture. So read more Scripture <laughs> to get your context straight. I suppose my recommendation is not original to me. I think I will borrow the Holy Spirit's words through Isaiah, as one is viewing life. Remember the grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. All that you know and hold dear here and now will eventually, ultimately, and inevitably fade and fail. It seems to me that it makes sense to invest in that now, which cannot be taken, nor faded, nor fail in the future. And so if a person wants to invest in his or her eternity, then they should make the greatest investment in the Word of God. Well, that is some good advice for the beginning of the year when everyone usually has a resolution to read through the word, I will say, as a tool. Years ago on this podcast, we had a professor named John Dyer of Dallas Theological Seminary come on and talk about technology, but he actually has created, I guess, a bot that you can just find online to help you create your own Bible reading program. So if you decide you want to read the whole Bible in a year, or maybe you just want to read the Old Testament or the New Testament, you can plug everything you want to do in there and it'll create a custom program for your Bible reading. So that might be more helpful to you than already created ones. But thank you to you both for being on the Postmodern Realities podcast. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Melanie. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much. You've been listening to episode 377 of the Postmodern Realities podcast. Today's guests were Cold Brigette and C.L. Mitchell. C.L. Mitchell has written an online cultural apologetics film review. His review is called The Danger of Rewriting Jesus, a review of the Book of Clarence. And you can read it for free at our website, equip.org. You won't want to miss out on subscribing to the other podcasts from the Christian Research Institute. We have the Bible Answer Man podcast, which is published Monday through Friday with the best of the week on Saturday. It's hosted by CRI President Hank Hanegraaff and is available wherever you get your favorite podcasts. In addition, Hank has a podcast called Hank Unplugged. Hank takes you out of the studio and into his study to engage in free-flowing, essential Christian conversations on critical issues with some of the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people on the planet. And you won't want to miss out on the brand new podcast from the Christian Research Journal. Christian Research Journal Reads presents audio versions of Christian Research Journal articles it was a print incarnation of almost 45 years. It's now on the web, as you know, with new articles every single week. So you won't want to miss these audio articles of some of our most popular and most accessed articles on our website, equip.org.